Hello students and welcome to the today's class. Today we are going to discuss an important issue related to the prevalence of economic systems in the Bronze Age civilizations. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about the agrarian economy, which was prevalent in the ancient Mesopotamia. There are certain objectives of today's lecture. And after reading this lesson, you will be able to understand the economic conditions under the Sumerians and the Akkadians. You will be also able to know about land management system, crops and livestock. And you will be also able to understand and examine the impact of the canals and irrigation facilities on the agrarian economy in ancient Mesopotamia. And lastly, you will be also able to know about various aspects of the domestic economy system in the ancient Mesopotamia. The eastern part of the region where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers flow south eastward to the Persian Gulf is termed as Fertile Crescent. A plain region between these rivers later came to be known as Mesopotamia, which in Greek means the land between the rivers. It is important to remember that Mesopotamia was regularly flooded by the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. A considerable layer of silt was left behind when the flood receded. The new and fertile soil helped farmers to produce large quantities of wheat and barley. The surplus produce helps villages to grow and prosper. Urbanization and rise of civilization has been gradually accelerated by the profitable agricultural produce. Unlike Egypt, an early Mesopotamian economic pattern was very straightforward and allowed people more opportunities for individual enterprises than public enterprises. The land was never an exclusive property of the king, either in theory or in practice. The trade or industry was not a monopoly of the government. However, the temples fulfilled many of the functions of a collectivist state. Because temples owned a large portion of the land and operates other business enterprises also, because of their unique ability to foresee seasonal changes and plan canal networks accordingly, priests have complete authority over the irrigation system. The majority of the population have less resources at their disposal. Serfs made up the vast majority of these people, but even the free ones did not have it easy due to the exorbitant rents they had to pay. Not only that, but public servants have a wide variety of duties to carry out. Slavery, as we know it now, was clearly not a significant institution then. Agriculture was a main economic pursuit of the majority of the people. The Sumerians are considered as excellent farmers. The knowledge of irrigation helped them to produce large quantities of cereal grains and subtropical fruits. The land was mainly divided into large estates held by the king, priestess and army. However, an average ruler resident was either a tenant or a serf. After agriculture, commerce was the second most important source of the Sumerian wealth. A flourishing trade established with most of the surrounding areas involved the exchange of metals and timber from the northern regions. Similarly, the trade with the west and lower valley was in agricultural products and handicraft goods respectively. The traders were highly professional as they regularly used bills, receipts, notes and letters of credit. Now we'll be talking about the Mesopotamian economic pattern. Mesopotamia was regarded home to some of the oldest farming communities of the ancient times. By approximately around 6000 BC in northern Babylonia, most of the staple crops were cultivated 
animals were domesticated and irrigation system was also well established. The availability of profitable cereals such as barley and wheat, irrigation facilities and use of plows contributed to the development of large scale farming. Despite its desert like climate, Mesopotamia became the richest agricultural region in the whole of ancient world. It is noted that the plants grown for food in ancient Mesopotamia provided 90% of the diet and the remaining 10% of the food supply came from the domesticated animals and their products like meat, milk, cheese and eggs. Barley was the most common agricultural produce and was used as a means of exchange with an accepted value like silver. There is no doubt the wages too were paid in barley. Grain and date trade among other items became the main forms of commerce. It is important to note that in ancient Mesopotamia, agricultural techniques were frequently developed in order to maximize production. This was especially accomplished in three ways. Number one, intensive use of the ground by planting more frequently, mixing crops and applying fertilizer. Number second, expanding the area of land use for agriculture. And number third, introducing new labor sources and strategies. There was uncertainty of food supply due to blight, locusts and the lake of rain. But the Mesopotamians survived by trade system, storage facility and war booty during those times. Law codes and other legal texts frequently referred to crop damage, usually by flooding. Before Assyrians, swarms of locusts also presented a major threat to agricultural crops. The rulers frequently received letters from provisional administrators about the locusts damaging the crops. Now coming to the crops and the livestock. The lake of rainfall in some areas of ancient Mesopotamia put a heavy burden on the vegetation. The majority of species that live in dry regions have either drought avoiding or drought resistant threats. Only the hilly regions received enough rain to sustain fields of cereal crops which were important dietary mainstays in Mesopotamia. The importance of cereal cultivation is explained in a Sumerian composition known as the Farmer's Instructions. This document contains important practical advices and reminders about the performing of proper rituals. Barley and emmer wheat were harvested with sickles, prepared with flint teeth, set in a wooden or bone handle. After the harvest, grain was judiciously stored in granaries near the agricultural fields or transported whenever possible on the waterways. The silos were portrayed as high and cylindrical, a shape that has remained unchanged to the present times. Some have a ladder attached to enable the grain carriers to climb up and empty their sacks. The amount of grain was measured by volume and not by weight. Barley replaced wheat as the primary staple because it was able to withstand greater salinity and aridity than wheat. Also, it provides flour and the basic ingredient in beer brewing. Millets and rice were introduced much later. Texts mainly mention important staples which were produced for temples, palaces and large private estates. References to garden cultivation are missing in most of the texts. The most frequently mentioned vegetables are onions, garlic, leeks, turnips, lettuce and cucumbers. Several spicy and aromatic seeds were part of the Mesopotamian diet such as cress, mustard, cumin and coriander. Linseed was the only oil seed cultivated before 6000 BC. It was usually used to produce fine oil, which rapidly became an important part of the staple food of the Mesopotamian diet. The date palm was first cultivated in Lower Mesopotamia and its position was unique as the every part of it could be used. There were separate male and female plants. 
the Sumerians practiced artificial fertilization of the female palm for the maximization of its produce. Lexical texts enlist 150 words for various palms and their different parts. It is noted that the date and pomegranate were the most common fruits, though apples, figs, pears, and plum were also known. The northern landscape of Mesopotamia was famous for the timber production. The main trees that are natives to Mesopotamia were tamarisk, poplars, willow, and a kind of pine. Few trees yield gum and resin, which was used for various purposes. Numerous sources indicate that Mesopotamian animal husbandry predates the Bronze Age. The early inhabitants of the ancient Near East used wild, tamed, or managed animals. At numerous excavated sites, the remains of wild mammals and birds were found, and it appears that these creatures may have been exchanged or even consumed during hard economic times. Throughout the history of ancient Mesopotamia, domesticated animals provided meat, dairy products, leather, wool, or hair. Pastoralists weaved animals as capital on the hoof, while the hunters weaved them as game to be redistributed. The animals meant for temple sacrifice had to be blemish and disease-free, and sometimes white for purity. All the domesticated animal species could be used for offerings to the gods. However, she played an important role in the religious sphere of the Mesopotamians. It is interesting to note that one of the most common ways of obtaining an omen was to present a question to the god and then kill a sheep and examine its liver. Sheep was the most economically and numerically significant animal because they were domesticated for the longest time and were widespread from the Mediterranean to the Indus Valley. Sheep and goats, known as small cattle, were also kept in large flocks that belonged to the king, temple, and even private persons. Flocks belonging to the temples were marked with the symbol of the god to whom they belonged. For instance, a spade for Marduk and a star for Ishtar. Cows, avas, and goats were important to the milk industry. A bas relief from the temple of Al Ubaid depicts the different stages. Cows were valuable and were not very often sacrificed except in the state ceremonies. Their primary importance was a source of traction. The evidence of the text is clear that cattle were used to plough the land before sowing and again in the seeding time. The plough was already in use in the Arak period as the existence of the cuneiform sign proves, and it has been suggested that earlier the evidence from the middle Ubaid level at Ras al Amiya is consonant with the use of oxen as pulo animals. A number of Akkadian seals have representation of the water buffalo, carved with such skill that no doubt can persist as far as it is identification. The texts contain references about ducks, geese, mallard, white stock, quail, and other birds. There is also mention of the fowler or bird keeper in many of the texts. A Babylonian proverb illuminated the role of the fowler and fisher in the following couplet, and I quote, The fowler who had no fish but had caught birds, holding his bird net, jumped into the city mouth. Honey collected from wild bees was rare and expensive. Its use is believed to have been started from the Paleolithic period onwards and evolved into fully apiculture by the 3rd millennium BC. The introduction of beekeeping was described on a stele discovered in the museum at Babylon. And I quote, I introduce the flies which collect honey which was in the time of my predecessors, nobody knew nor introduced, and located them in the garden of the town, Gabarini, that they might collect honey and wax. I even understood how to separate the honey from the wax by boiling, 
my gardeners also knew this unquote practicing agriculture in any society can't be done without the irrigation practices so canals and irrigation system had played a very important role in ancient mesopotamia also the city states of the ancient near east were essentially farming communities and the majority of inhabitants were farmers their successful local agriculture and the creation of extensive irrigation were the cornerstones of their governmental structure at the same time some of the myths focused on the annual farming cycle and fear of destruction from flood storm drought and other disasters the earliest farming communities were mostly located in rainfall and other areas that had a variety of natural resources it is from around 5000 bc that artificial watering appeared on the alluvial fans of smaller water courses to support rain fed farming agricultural land was best classified by its water supply which regulated farming the types of crops the amount of fields and the total area of land cultivated mesopotamia has two types of agriculture dry farming in the northern assyria and irrigation farming in the southern part that is babylonia and sumer dry farming relied only on rainfall and was practiced in the northern mesopotamia while the large scale irrigation with complex canal systems supplemented by natural rainfall was particularly used in southern mesopotamia the produce varies according to a type of the farming irrigation helped in solving four problems number 1 the supply which means getting the water needed number second is the storage which means keeping water wherever it is needed number third is the drainage system which means the disposal of water when no longer it is needed and number four is the protection which means that keeping away unwanted water from the fields as far back as the 3rd millennium bc gardens or small areas were watered by hand from wells or streams but for the cereal crops the most practical system was gravity flow irrigation water was brought to the fields by smaller branching canals or by aligning major water channels parallel to the main rivers it is noted that two controls were essential outlets and regulators for irrigation kitchen gardens were layered so that a variety of crops share the same ground the sumerians established tree shade gardening planting their gardens close to the rivers or canals in order to control irrigation a myth written in the sumerian rites i quote inanna and shukaletoda the gardener's mortal sin i unquote shukaletoda was motivated by the gods to invent the shade garden which he planted with the sarbatu tree in this way all types of green plants that previously had been burned by the hot winds now blossomed in the shade the gardens were shaded by palm trees and their shade smaller fruit trees like citrus pomegranate and even apple then vegetables including peas beans lentils leeks cucumbers lettuces and garlic and seasonings were grown an essential component of the early mesopotamian diet was fishing there were variety of methods and tools used for fishing it is important to mention that as many as 50 kinds of fish are mentioned in the sumerian texts and documents unfortunately many sumerian and akkadian expressions and terms for fish found in economic documents are not understood and from the old babylonian period fish and fishing were not mentioned frequently as earlier now talking about the land management system the land was flat and there was an inadequate drainage facility problems of soil salinization have been documented from around 2000 bc or earlier canals were generally redug to reverse the process however when irrigation was no longer possible settlements were abandoned the movement to northern mesopotamia around the 2nd millennium bc was most probably spurred 
by the search for fertile and arable land. The cultivation of most cereal crops and large-scale planting of date palms was carried out on several levels. For example, number one, on extensive temple and palace land, either directly or farmed out. Number second, on private land. And number third, on the small plots allotted to city poor nomads and the shepherds. The amount of land held by everyone can't be recognized and probably varied according to the time, period, region and condition of the soil. The amount of land rented by the city developers to private individuals or partnerships increased through time, reaching its maximum in the new Babylonian period. Parallel to this development, the employment of slaves, serfs, and other menials to work on the land declined. The farmer probably drew the plow himself, while other laborers toiled to increase plowing speed. A standard team could possibly plow one eco or harrow, six eco a day. A three-man team worked 66.75 eco, plowing and then harrowing three times, total of 100 days work. A seed plow seems to have covered about two eco per day. During the Akkadian period, plots of four to ten eco were the norm and represented the farm size needs to support a family. The expenses of farming include seed, pullo, tools and draft animals which were expensive because oxen needed good food to work. In Mesopotamia, pullo oxen were fed barley during the working season. The laborers also had to be fed either in rations or by residual share of the crop. Major irrigation works were generally performed during slack seasons. According to the sources, the average cost of a slave during the old Babylonian era was 20 shekels of silver, with prices occasionally rising to 90 shekels. The farmers in different texts and law courts or leases formed ruler sub-elite of those who held land and were responsible for working. Records of the institutional lands of Sumer during the third dynasty of Ur provide best documentation of the most efficient farming in the world. The agricultural year began with the spring equinox when the half of the lands were full of standing produce and half were lying fallow from the previous harvest. After clod breaking, sowing took place in the month of October the seed was planted in drizzled furrows using seed plow by four men. An ordinary plow with a funnel was attached to the feed to seed. Also, hand drilling was employed, followed by a man with a plow. The field was then watered to remove salt. The Sumerian text, the farmer's instructions, expressed three waterings during the growth period, while a fourth late watering could add an extra 10% to the produce. Barley, the main crop, was comparatively tolerant of salinity. The temple and palace administrations were maintained by rations of food, oil and clothing. Both of these are considered as households, the temple for God and the palace for the king. The finest farming organizations were those of the temple rather than those of the state. The temple was considered the main institution of the early dynastic urban economy. For Sumer, in the third dynasty of Ur, large collections of clay tablets furnished comprehensive information of a centralized administration for increase of agricultural production. Undoubtedly, that the economic basis of the temple was agriculture, the temple managed its estates working certain portion of its own land giving the rest as fiefs to temple employees and private citizens. Also, it rented some land on a share cropping basis. However, the temple gradually lost its hold in the Sumerian economy. Secular palaces were constructed as lavishly as the temples. The palace at Kish was surrounded by a thick buttressed wall which had more than 50 rooms.
some for storage purposes. The farmers of the southern Mesopotamia were aware of the varying quality of their fields, which they consider to use their resources most efficiently. In one of the land survey records, an official explained the estates as good and middling. The domestic economy. Templars amassed gold, silver and lapis lazuli, but the average old Babylonian citizen had a modest belongings. Cereals and other agricultural products were not mentioned in the palace's commercial transactions. However, the palace benefited from large, even excessive amounts of grain from its adherents and the lands it directly farmed. Perhaps the palace kept grain in reserve for hard times and famine. Also, it is believed that grain might have functioned as currency. As such, grain would be less marketable than other goods sold by the merchants. The phrase, I quote, as purchase goods, unquote, mentions to the purchase of goods rather than their resale. It is significant to mention that Ur III balance sheets used silver as a unit of accounting. From the Ur III period, silver was imported and taxed. In the old Babylonian period, the palace controls a circulation of silver. However, the accumulations of silver as treasure were restricted to the palace and the temple. It is true, societies that used metal as currency presented it in some specific form. Silver was weighed in Mesopotamia, but certain texts from the old Babylonian period through the old Akkadian period mention casting valuable metals into rings as a method of metal storage. In the early 2nd millennium BC, silver was the preferred currency, but use of barley was not abandoned altogether. Other commodities, including metals such as copper, tin, bronze, and gold available from the fringe of Mesopotamia were all used as currencies that they at least functioned as a means of payment. Silver was used as a standard of accounting, although gold also served this purpose later in the Amarna age. Standardized ingots have been found at various archaeological sites. Because of their large size and rarity, both the ingots and rings were probably not used as a medium of exchange, although all the other functions of currency might apply. To determine the amount, silver and other metals were weighed on a scale. If lesser quantities were required, the metal block or wire was broken into smaller pieces, which were then weighed. The Akkadian word for the silver means the broken thing. Also, the other words in Akkadian refer to broken bits of silver and the process of breaking metals and weighing each item was widely attested before and even after the coinage was introduced. The most commonly found quality of silver was known as alloy 1 8th. It was used to pay taxes, to purchase property including estates and even slavers. However, the actual weighing remains a mystery. No complete balance has been found intact and thus we do have actual series of weights. Now in conclusion, we can say the alluvial soil was incredibly fertile due to its rich and diverse mineral concentration. But it was not until humans had considerably improved their ability to adapt to the environment through control of the waterways by which was possible to take the advantage of region's resources. It was only then that the first large-scale communities began to develop in which people began to reap profit from a surplus produce. It also supports the diversification of their cultural pursuits and the influx of people into a brand new type of urban collective community. Perhaps the greatest enduring legacy of Mesopotamian culture is the invention and development of cities. 
So this is all what we have to understand under the title economy during the ancient Mesopotamian culture. I hope you have understood the lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you.